I'm Sean Haney, and this is Real Ag on the Weekend. Let's get real and get connected with the week that was in Canadian agriculture. Real Ag on the Weekend starts now. Welcome to Real Ag on the Weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. It is great to be here back for another week on 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. It was a great week and well, a busy week here in agriculture as uh, we're, you know, we're seeing some dust flying. Some people are getting rolling in terms of getting some seed in the ground, which is uh, very, very good to see here in the first week of May. Okay, a lot of topics to discuss today. We're going to be joined by Nova Scotia MP and also chair of the Standing Committee on Agriculture. It is Mr. Cody Blois. He represents the fine people of King Hans in Nova Scotia and uh, was actually also recently in Saskatchewan touring some farms and doing that kind of stuff. He's uh, very, very connected to the industry. They have, the Standing Committee on Agriculture has a new report out about feeding the world. There's a whole bunch of recommendations in there and we're going to ask him about some of those recommendations here today on the program. We're also going to hear today from Christian Hebert of Hebert Grain Ventures based in Saskatchewan a new pilot project in regards to measuring carbon sequestration on his farm. We'll hear from him on that. We've got the president and CEO of uh, Crop Life Canada, Pierre Patel, also here. Big decision this week by CFIA, a long-awaited decision, uh, on gene editing. And what is that? So what does it mean for farmers? And the other part of it is what, what are some of the next steps that have to happen in order for this all to be behind us in terms of the full approval and commercialization of gene editing as a conventional bread crop in Canada. And then we'll finish up talking some agronomy. We've got Carmen Prang from Sask Wheat on the show today to talk about seed testing as well as an update on the use of Lambda Psi products through the growing season as well. If you have any feedback on today's program, we'd love to hear from you. You can send me an email. It is shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media channels as Real Agriculture or call the Real Ag Feedback line 855-776-6147. Well, like I mentioned, the Standing Committee on Agriculture has put out a report at the in April and it, it, it's all about, you know, what are some of the ways that the, the Canadian government could make changes to help better, you know, raise food security in the country, uh, improve exports, uh, and, and, and really make a difference, okay? A lot, a lot of different recommendations. There's a lot. And, 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 and Boyce talks about how the fact there's probably too many. Now, this is, this is from the Standing Committee on Agriculture. This is a very bipartisan effort. This isn't just, you know, Boyce is, a, of course, a liberal MP, but he, th- this is the contributions, the work from also the NDP, the Bloc, and, and the Conservatives as well, okay? So uh, I had a chance to chat with him this week. Now, the full interview can be found at realagriculture.com or on our Real Agriculture YouTube channel as well. Here's a piece of it. I asked Blois about why we're doing this work. What, what is the purpose of this work from the committee? And what are some of the recommendations that stood out for him? So I, I want to take you back to it would have been spring of last year when real concerns, uh, of course, were arising about global food security because of the war in Ukraine uh, and because of the conditions that we were seeing and, and continue to see, frankly, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, the committee felt it was really important moment in time to actually call witnesses in an international context to understand how Ukraine being such an important uh, grain producer on a global market, but also, frankly, Russia and uh, and Belarus being major potash uh, and fertilizer producers, uh, that this is going to have consequences. And so the committee undertook a study to understand the impact internationally. That really uh, played into about June of last year. We provided recommendations to the government at that time, really more in an international aid perspective to support farmers in Ukraine and some of the circumstances we were seeing on the ground. This fall, uh, the committee took a little bit more of a domestic view about ways in which we can help support the Canadian agriculture sector just to keep doing the good work that is already happening, frankly. So that was the context. Uh, parliamentary committees, their role is really essentially to provide recommendations up to the government. The government has uh, so many days to respond once these committees come. The goal, of course, is to increase profile on the issues that parliamentarians think are important and hope that the uh, government may take us up in some of the uh, some of the angles that we push. Bipartisan effort. Of course, there's representatives from all the different parties. So this isn't 
a document that's just you know from the perspective of the liberal party that you're a member of this this is this also includes other parties so a bipartisan effort which i think uh is uh makes the document i don't know if i would say unique but i i think it's definitely worth people going through it and reading uh, what the committee produced so from your perspective as the chair there, there's a lot of recommendations here um, we're not going to go through all of them, of course, but what do you think is one of the key ones that uh, really you hope that the the Canadian government takes hold of and pays attention to? So just a couple. I want to go back to your comment and, and just flag for, for guys like John Barlow. We got Yves Perron, um, Alistair McGregor. We, we do have really good um, collaboration on the committee. Uh, so I certainly want to give a tip of the cap. Francis Drouin helps lead our side on the Liberal part. Um we're almost so collaborative that I think when I look at the recommendations, I think there's about 22 or 23. I, I think we could have pared it down. I think in the fall, we started to get into a lot of different dynamics um, of of the art of the possible, which is great. But in this world, I think we need to be a little bit more focused. Uh, Sean, a couple of the areas that I think are particularly important. Uh, we talked about asking for clarification on C-208, which came in the budget, which I was happy to see the government uh, provide that clarity because at the end of the day, when we look about making sure that there's a generational transfer of assets, uh, that particular piece of legislation is extremely important. There was some uh, legitimate concerns from finance about making sure that the actual transfer happened. And I think the clarity that has been provided uh, is extremely positive. Uh, we were calling on the minister to uh, provide clarity on guidance for gene editing. We know this is particularly important. Uh, I don't know if the minister's made her announcement yet today, but I know that there's something. Yes. She did. Okay, she good. Did. Uh, so, you know, those are a couple areas on domestic side that I think are extremely important. There are kind of some fan favorites that we've been talking about for a while uh, on temporary farm workers, uh, maybe not necessarily as big in Western Canada, but particularly big in the hort and uh, fruit growing sectors uh, in Central Canada and Eastern Canada. Um, and, and certainly talking about things like inner switching and important rail infrastructure. We saw in the budget uh, that uh, the government's going to be working to extend the uh, inner switching elements. I know that's going to be very welcome news in the part of the country that you call home, Sean. Um, so those are some of the things that are there. Some of these things have been talked about for a while, but I just gave you a few examples where the government is moving on them. I think we should celebrate those, but at the same time push uh, to continue to do more. And I think we're at a moment in time right now with what has transpired in the last year, that there is an increased focus on food security. I think there's an increased understanding from Canadians that may not call rural Canada home uh, about the importance of farming and the importance of men and women that put food on our plate, but also around the world. So now's the time to continue to push for the needs and, and public policy priorities for farmers so that Canada can be playing uh, an even more outsized role than we already do. One of the recommendations was that the government, I, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but relook and and reevaluate its position on the fertilizer tariffs uh, in regards to fertilizer coming out of Russia. Canada is still the only G7 country. We heard from you know 27 different farm groups in Ontario yesterday putting out a release. I know they've sent a letter to Minister Freeland saying, you know, let's get rid of these tariffs. Um, any response from the government on on that recommendation? So in the budget, and I, I suspect you've already talked about this, but certainly in the budget. Uh, there was a focus uh, on being able to take the monies that the government had collected in the early days. You can remember that there was some uncertainty about shipments that had already left uh, ports and were arriving in Canada and what the implications were. Uh, that money is going back through off-calf in terms of a program that's going to help farmers. I know the minister has talked about uh, some of the difficulty in the accounting exercise of figuring out exactly who paid and who hadn't. I, I think this is probably at least a step in the right direction to recognize some of the impact that has happened. Uh, I know suppliers, Sean, have made adjustments to try to get around. I, I think farmers at the end of the day understand that we're all in this collectively. You're right. Canada is one of the only G7. I believe Japan is the other. But I do take notice that this is a challenge. And this is one way that which Canada is helping to contribute. We've looked at other ways to help support through the advanced payment program. Uh, I don't know if the government's going to make a move. The committee obviously highlighted that concern. Um, but I do think it's a broader opportunity. Let me say this. When we look at the capacity that exists in Western Canada, I've asked companies, fertilizer companies that have appeared before the Agriculture Committee, how do we start looking at building self-sufficiency across the country? We have such great assets in Western Canada. How do we find a way to make sure that potash coming from Saskatchewan is supporting farmers in my area in Nova Scotia 
even if it takes some ability for government to get involved to help build the case, I think in a world right now, why do we want to be supporting countries around the world that are making war against peaceful countries instead of uh, actually building that self-sufficiency in the country? So I think there's a bigger conversation to be had. And I know and I can appreciate some of the frustration I was on the ground in Ontario, but I think from moral high ground, we've got it right. And we do have other plans to try to help support farmers. You know, too many times we treat the Canadian shield as if it we, we live in two separate countries. Like it's some sort of barrier. And yeah, it, it's in some ways it is a barrier physically, but this country has to figure out how to really think about infrastructure and the way that we move natural resources much more strategically from coast to coast. And, and I, I wonder, even if rail freight of getting, say, n- uh, nitrogen, urea, from the West to Eastern Canada, even if there was like, it, it's cheaper to use ocean freight and get it from, from Russia, as an example, or from some other country, maybe I mean, that's what Blois is talking about there when he, when he, when he mentions you know, government support to do this. I, I, I really wonder if that's what he's hinting at. But uh, that, that was Cody Blois. He is MP from King Haunts in Nova Scotia. Appreciate him joining me. Like I said, you can find the entire interview by going to realagriculture.com. When we come back, we are going to hear from Pierre Patel. He is president and CEO of CropLife Canada. Big decision this week on gene editing by CFIA. You're listening to Real Ag on the Weekend, 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. Hey, I'm Kelvin Hepner, and I just wanted to give you a, a heads up about a new project that we are working on here at Real Agriculture together with the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, or CAPI. We're calling it the Ag Policy Connection. Stay tuned. The first episodes of the Ag Policy Connection brought to you by Real Agriculture and the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute. They'll be showing up here on Real Agriculture and in your podcast feed on your podcast player shortly. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith of realagriculture.com. Join me Monday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern for The Agronomists, Canada's only live interactive agronomy-based show. Each week, we answer your most pressing questions with a rotating panel of agronomists, researchers, and extension staff from across Canada. Join me Monday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or head to realagriculture.com slash live at 8 p.m. Eastern. You know, a lot of times when products come to market, we, we think about the, the price of that product. We don't think a lot about the research and the dollars that are have to go into getting that, say, seed variety into the bag at the final commercialization when you pick it up at retail. And we, we, I don't need to tell you, seed has definitely gone up in, in cost. And, 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 and it's not just the seed cost. A lot of that, say on a, a bag of canola or a bag of soybeans, bag of corn, that, that a lot of that cost is actually in the trait, right? Like the herbicide tolerance, for example, or, or the, uh, the drought resistance trait or you, uh, corn bore like BT, things like that. So, uh, that's, that's, that is no secret. One of the things the plant breeding industry is, is very keen on doing is being able to access something like gene editing. You, you've heard of like CRISPR-Cas9, I'm sure it's some sort of farm meeting that, that you have attended. And the idea here is that Canada is looking at not classifying gene editing as, as, uh, as GMO, that it would be conventional breeding. And we, we've taken two of the three steps here this week. CFIA had an announcement, a press conference led by the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, Marie-Claude Bebeau, this week. And uh, I got the reaction from Pierre Patel. He is the president and CEO of CropLife Canada. Here's what he had to say about this week's announcement by CFIA. The, the way plant breeding innovations like gene editing get approved is there's three kind of pillars. There's the food side by Health Canada, there's the environment side and the feed side. Right? And those are managed by CFIA. And so what we saw today was the release of the second pillar, uh, the environment side. So Health Canada released their guidance last year. Very good, science-based, solid. I think it provides a lot of clarity to industry, to innovators, both small and large. Uh, and what what we were waiting for is the CFIA guidance to 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 support that because you can't just do one pillar. 
And, and this is what we've been anxiously waiting for. And so today was the environment side. So there's just one piece left is the feed side, but we're hoping that'll just come in sequence uh, very quickly here. But this is what we've been waiting for is the guidance for innovators, again, small, large, public, private, to know the rules of the game as to what is considered novel, what would need a full review versus uh, be treated like a uh, conventional bread crop. That's what we were waiting for. Do we do we understand yet the timeline for that third pillar, that feed pillar to be determined? Well, we're pushing hard that they uh, that they get the because they have to do a consultation phase and that hasn't happened. So we're hoping that they will go to consultation like right away this spring so that we can they can finalize the the, uh, the final document by the fall. Is there, and maybe this is a really kind of silly way to look at it. Is this, is this the highest of the three hurdles or is this like, is this, are all hurdle or all three of the pillars kind of treated equally in terms of the test that we have to pass here? How, how do we view this last, this last pillar? Uh, that's a good question, Sean. I think, um, you know, from our perspective, the food issue that Health Canada reviewed really serves as a model for feed because really you're talking about how how whether or not these products have any impact on on someone or something consuming them and so we think the parameters and the um the criteria for what's in what's out should be very much aligned with uh with the health canada model that's already out and and published so so we we we're pretty confident that um that the the, the last piece should be fairly straightforward and uh and there's no reason to to delay publication of it now, you said something earlier, which I th I think is an important point when we talk about gene editing, and that was like large, medium, and small innovators. A lot of times we think about innovation in this in the breeding space. We think about large, but we we and we know who those players are. From your perspective at CropLife, why is this important? This decision on gene editing. Why is this important for small and medium innovators? So the the current practice, I mean, if you if you want to bring a, a traditional genetically modified crop to market, it is you got to have deep pockets. It's, it's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of research and regulatory costs and, and support and infrastructure. And so that's why the the benefits of GMOs have really been limited to a few very large acre crops and limited to pretty big multinational companies. What, what gene editing does is it opens this up because the costs are, are so much less and the specificity and um, and, and ability to get a ROI is, is much, much easier. And so now you've got universities, you've got startups, you've got medium-sized companies that can play in this field and create almost field-specific requirements. So if a, a particular mill needs a particular type of flour for their specific type of pasta or bread, they can almost tailor that to the field level and and it's not you know hundreds of millions of dollars worth of investment so that's what's exciting about it, is that really the uh, the variety of potential new innovations that could come of this and then the value added that comes from that and and all of the uh the the compounding effects of that and so this decision now just lay it out here for us cuz you're 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 in the weeds of this on a daily basis so to speak Basically, gene editing is 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 deemed to be the same as conventional breeding, um, and not a, a GM type of of breeding. But they are going to come up with, in the I guess in the spirit of transparency, there's going to be some sort of list or database that they're building. Talk about that. Yeah. So, firstly, on the on on the uh, on the list, um, that's actually industry that's that's created a database that will provide clarity on. Which uh, which traits have been approved, and which uh, through which mechanism? So whether it's gene editing or or otherwise, uh, um, it's not just. So there, there's a lot of sectors, right? The, the grain trade sometimes has customers that need that information. So they were they wanted that transparency from the seed sector in order to really be supportive of this uh, of this technology. And what the industry has done is developed a a mechanism to ensure that. Whoever needs that transparency will have access to it. And for the grower on the ground, nothing really changes. They they get their information from seed guides. If you're an organic grower, you see exactly what's suitable for organic production or not. 
none of that information is going to change. That transparency and communication uh, is not affected by this this release of this document. So that part of it is is uh, it, you know nothing changes right in terms of transparency. And what and in fact, Canada and and what the industry is doing here is gone further than any other jurisdictions in terms of the the involvement and and commitment to transparency and creating these databases for the value chain. And so we're, we're pretty proud of that. And I think it has meant that we're aligned. So the grain industry is aligned with the life science companies in, in, in this technology and, and seeing the benefits of it. And, uh, and that's not the same everywhere in the world. One of the things that Patel notes in his entire interview with me that you can find at realagriculture.com is that Canada at one time was like really in a leadership position here on, on looking at gene editing. And, and a lot of time has passed and now is really playing catch up. And so when you look at countries like the US, Australia, and and others in, in the world of competitiveness, there's a real concern. Now, one of the key things here, and this is one of those things I'll be watching, is this idea, you, know, you talked about some of the field-centric sort of solutions. Does, because a lot of people believe that having access to gene editing technology like CRISPR-Cas9 really provides the opportunity for medium and even small breeders to compete with the big boys, so to speak. We'll see if that's something that comes really to to fruition uh, for, for sure. But big day, a lot of celebration, Canadian Sea Growers Association, farm groups, everybody probably, I would say, for the most part, except for the NFU having um, NFU has a big problem with this uh, and they've uh, been quite vocal about their displeasure, about the decision, other farm groups uh, much in support. So well, let's take a break. We'll come back here with more on real Egg on the weekend on 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. The next generation is the future of agriculture, but how do we launch from one role to leading? From succession planning and family dynamics to understanding finances and making the tough calls to discovering paths others have taken all through agriculture, the Successors Podcast covers it all. Tune in with me, your host, Kara Oosterhaus, simply by searching The Successors on your favorite podcast platform, or you can find it by visiting www.realagriculture.com. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on realagriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. One of the farmers I always enjoy having conversations with is Christian Hebert of Hebert Grain Ventures in Saskatchewan, and many of you will know Christian. And they, they did made an announcement a couple of weeks ago talking about doing a pilot project, trying to get some numbers around the impact of of carbon sequestration on the farm, and and, and trying to, as he will explain, getting that a little bit closer to actually checks being written for the work that you were doing on your farm in this area of sustainability. I first asked Christian, you had made an announcement here recently that you're going to be doing, a, a, I guess, a pilot project with Kanza. Um, now, what exactly is Kanza? Yeah, so Kanza is the Canadian Alliance for Net Zero Agriculture. It kind of got rolled out of uh, RBC creating their climate action fund or institute they called it and, and it's one of the first projects that came out of it and um, we've been part of a few different meetings you know out east around working with large companies that deal with those of us in agriculture and also farms themselves on trying to measure 
uh, carbon because I do truly believe we're the solution. And, and really that's what this pilot project is, is how can we work together to make agriculture one of the first net zero industries? Because as I said, I, I do believe fully and based on our data and the work we've done already that primary producers are net sequesters of carbon. And, and we should be able to sell that up the chain and in insets so that as an industry, we can we can show the world that not only are we feeding it, we're also net zero. We're going to get to insets versus outsets here in a, in a second. But so you in this pilot project, you're going to be measuring, testing and quantifying carbon sequestration that's actually happening on your farm. What does that look like from a practicality standpoint? Like, what, what are you doing? Well, there's a bunch of science that's even above my head. But f from a base, I mean, organic matter is what he sequesters carbon. Right, that it's it's what works with the plants through photosynthesis to put the carbon in the ground and store it, and and so the the biggest thing is is can we improve organic matter annually or at least on three year periods or five year periods or ten year periods, and especially in Western Canada, it's something we need to be pretty proud about because we we are virtually one of the best in the world at what we've done to organic matter in Western Canada, mainly tied to zero till. Um, the, the one issue that I find every time I talk about carbon with the groups, though, and, and around the world is how do we get it so that it can be, I don't want to say easy, but kind of doable for more and more operators. And so what we're trying to figure out is, is can we use the measurement of organic matter and carbon measurements in the soil, carbon burnoff, soil tests, et cetera, and then figure out which exact management practices are allowing those to increase so that in the end, carbon could actually be sold based on a, an algorithm tied to your metric tons of output. Because what's the one thing we really measure good in agriculture? Oh, what we right. sell. Whether it's grain or beef or pork, that's the one piece of data that's really quite strong. And so hopefully with some of these pilot projects, we can go from the scientific way of figuring out are we improving carbon and sequestering carbon to having, let's say, algorithms that can do a lot of the calculations for us and have it tied to output. And that's just so that more and more of the industry can can be part of this without the same time you know breaking the bank to invest in the technologies etc that you need to do it yeah so from a end goal perspective simplicity i like that i i find when we talk about this topic a lot of times it the complexity drives itself into the discussion so quickly it it just flies you talk about flying over your head it flies completely over my head and trying to get my head wrapped around okay what does this actually look like on the farm because we're hearing a lot of promises from governments in Canada and south of the border when it comes to this is uh, some sort of potential secondary income for for farmers yet we're having a hard time quantifying it on the ground level which seems to be where we should start first yeah i completely agree and i mean i, I think one thing is this as farmers or to be honest, most consumers we struggle with most promises from government <laughs> at this at this point in time globally. Um, but you're right, simple government and we're going to get money from them are not real terms that we're all comfortable with. So I completely agree. I've told this to both government and large companies that like I'm actually starting to get a little bit sick and tired of white papers and talking about it. We have to get to the point where it's simple enough somebody can write a pharma check because that really I like to test on check writers, not on storytellers, right? And and so how do we move from storytelling, which which there's parts of it I believe, and and fundamentally I can go up to a million in feet and say, carbon technically maybe is a farce if we're not going to hold large emitters across the globe accountable. We'll just use China and, and Russia as two examples, and and currently as governments we're not willing to do that. But at the same time, I do believe. That is, it has become a hot topic in consumers' world, and and guess what? Consumers write us checks for our food, and so we have to find a way to deal with this logically. And and so, how do we make it simple? And really, my big thing too out of the pilot is how do we how do we turn the view that agriculture is the solution, not the villain, right? I, I'm done kind of listening that we're using big equipment that has exhaust and that cows are farting too much and burping too much. You know, we're we're one of the only industries in the world that have a that have a large greenhouse on a large number of days of the year and plants sequester carbon. And from what, as I said, we did a section in our first pilot and it, and it showed pretty significant gains in sequestration over the last three years, five years and 30 years. And so that's the big thing is how can, how can we make sure we tell the story right backed by data and science that agriculture is the solution. Now you're a numbers guy. Do you have a number 
in mind now that it could be, you know, per acre or it could be a percentage of revenue. Like, do you have a number in mind that this needs to get to where people are paid for, you know, their, their, their carbon sequestration and it's worth your while. I, I, your, your yeah. numbers guy, what number do you have in mind? Yeah. So, I mean, right now I've been pretty upfront to say that I want to see that number between 20 and $30 an acre annually, and then it will climb based on what carbon tax climbs. I mean, that's kind of the, the one neat thing of what the market's being created by is, is emitters are going to have kind of the choice. Do they buy offsets or insets or do they pay carbon tax? To the government and and usually it's really easy to deal with a company to say hey i'm one of your customers i can sell you credits instead of paying more tax and, and usually they'll they would rather buy a credit so as as carbon tax values increase actually that value per acre would increase right because it's just a it's just a percentage you know how much carbon are you sequestering how many metric tons and what's a metric ton of carbon worth I think the point that I agree with Christian the most there on is that we have to have a system that is not necessarily simple, but it's easier for p- as many people to access as possible. And it's actually math that everybody can understand. And we have a lot of storytelling and not a lot of check writing at this point. There's still some stuff to be figured out. The U.S. moving much more quicker than Canada, uh, but there's not, there's still time. And, and the question is the amount, right? And and Christian shared his expectations on his farm, what he thinks those amounts have to be per acre. We will see where that is in comparison to the reality and what some of the uptake is. But of course, things like no-till, is is a big thing in Saskatchewan for for sure. Let's take a break. And you, oh, by the way, you can hear the rest of that interview at realagriculture.com or it's also posted on our YouTube channel. Let's take a break. We'll be back with more on Real Ag on the Weekend here on 980 CGME and 650 CKOM. Want to get the best out of your soybean crops? Whether you've been growing them for a generation or are just starting into soybeans, Find what you need to know at SoybeanSchool.com. You'll see videos on growing tips, pest control, and much more from specialists across the region, all in one place. Easy for you to access from your desktop, tablet, or mobile phone. Maximize your yields by staying up to date with the Soybean School, presented by BASF, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Before you get back in the field this year, spend some time with the Corn School on RealAgriculture.com. Get all the information you need on hybrid selection, planting depth, crop inputs, and more from a wide range of industry experts. A massive library of video content is available on demand when you need it most. Spend your time outside of the field, inside the classroom, with The Corn School on realagriculture.com. Back to Real Ag on the weekend. I'm your host, Sean Haney of realagriculture.com. Joined right now by Carmen Prang. She's the agronomy extension specialist with Sask Wheat. Carmen, great to have you. Thanks for having me. Okay, lots happening right now. Uh, there's a lot of farmers in Saskatchewan that are, they're, they're fully, uh, they're scratching the itch and they're able to get going or they're just waiting very, very patiently in some of those more uh, wetter areas of, of the province. Um we we should see with some of the weather patterns and stuff kind of, as you kind of look out we we should be able to see the majority of the province kind of really get rolling here in the next week no yeah that would be what i would think we've heard some reports of guys just kind of getting started especially around the Saskatoon area like you said um if guys have received snow that big dump that we got a little while ago um they might slowly just be getting going and still kind of working in the yard but yeah hopefully by next week everyone's rolling and it should be good and hopefully seeding wheat correct yes. correct Yes, exactly. That's usually one of the first things to go in. So, uh huh. We had to get that out there uh, as well. Okay, exactly. so at, at this time of the year, we one of the things that we need to think about is the quality of the seed that we are we are putting in the ground. Now, obviously, there's an opportunity to purchase certified seed, but not everybody's doing that. If you are going to use your own seed, seed testing really important. Don't make any assumptions. Test your seed. Yes, exactly. Seed is the foundation of every crop. It is the first thing that will really give your crop the best chance for success. And we want to make sure that we're putting in healthy, clean seed um, as one of our very first steps. So um, usually by this time of the year, you probably would already want to have a seed test done. Um, Oddly enough, I did get an email this morning that said from one of the seed labs that they can do a rush order if you haven't 
um, got your testing done yet. Um, and even if you're pulling stuff out of the bin and you're kind of realizing that there might be some issues, it's probably better to get it tested before you put it in the ground. So we can figure out that if there are issues, we can address that before. Yeah. And we have to be careful here. And I know we're talking, you know, you're working with Sasqui, but I think of malt barley as an example here where, you know, we can see real changes in that germination from fall till now. So we need to be careful. Yes, definitely. Things can definitely change over the winter. And um, so it's always good to get it kind of tested in the spring as close to seeding as possible. You still want to give yourself enough time if you are having issues that you can still find another seed source um, and you don't want to leave that too late. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at things like germination and vigor. You always want that to be over 85%. So if you're seeing that to be under, you want to give yourself enough time to maybe find some different seed um, and that can change. And if your germination and vigor aren't, um, they should be correlated. They should be similar. And if they're not, that means there could have been issues over the winter that need to be addressed. Okay. From from a wheat variety perspective, let's say spring wheat. I'm going to say I'm going to go into the field next week. So I'm say, let's just say May 10th. Okay. I'm, I'm going to hit the field May 10th. What is the, like, how big of a gap can I have from my seed test to when I'm going to hit the field? Is is there some kind of standard recommendations there? Um, no, not really. Like, um, you just want to give yourself enough time to see those results and if you need to find a different seed source. So the test does take a couple of days to get to the lab and to run those results and things like that. So one of the big issues over the winter that has taken up a lot of the discussions in some of the boardrooms through conference season, I know when I was at a crop production show in Saskatoon in January, this was a big discussion is what's happening with the Lambda Psi products, uh, pro products like Matador, for example. And there's questions about what, you know, the, from an end use perspective that uh, crops that have been sprayed with one of these Lambda Psi products, I think Silencer is the other one, right? Yeah. Um, they can't go into the feed system. So it can be for food use, yes. Feed use, no. I know that seems a little bit backwards, but that's the way it is. What do we need to be thinking about here? What what have you learned from Sasweet's perspective? Yeah, so this has definitely been a hot topic and there's definitely been a lot of conversation going on about it. Um, we have definitely been following the Grains Council's advice on what to do and what kind of messaging to be providing to our farmers on that. Um, from an agronomic or um, agronomic perspective, um, we really just want you to be checking with your grain buyer if you're going to use these products. Um, Adama did announce that Silencer will be available for the 2023 season. So it is going to be out there. Um, just know that if you are going to use these products, check with your grain buyer, work with your retail and your agronomist to make sure that you have all the information before you make that decision to use that product. Um, we would also just recommend um, that you do know that there are other products available that you can use. With insecticides, we are a little bit more limited as compared to herbicides, but check out your guide to crop protection. Um, it's always a great resource. And then as well, um, some of the SAS crop commissions, so SAS Pulse, SAS Canola, SAS Barley, and SAS Wheat have put together a document that is available on our websites that lists some alternative options that you can use as well. Um, so check that out. Um, check out the Keep It Clean website. They give some great recommendations on if you are going to use these products, how to best use them. So Agronomically, there's going to be some challenges here potentially in season, especially if we have a big outbreak of something like grasshoppers, for example, and Saskatchewan, no stranger to grasshoppers. No, exactly. And the 2023 grasshopper forecast map is out right now. There are some red hot spots on it. And even if you aren't in a hot spot, um, there is the possibility too that you will have them. So it's just kind of a guide. Make sure that you're out checking your own fields because, um, yeah, it is going to be a possible issue if it is dry again. So um, there are alternatives and you can start thinking ahead of time about your IPM approach and just being scouting more and being more vigilant that way. That was Carmen Prang. She's the Agronomy Extension Specialist with Sask Wheat Commission. If you have any feedback on today's show, send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or of course, call the Real Ag Feedback Line, 855-776-6147. We couldn't get to everything here uh, on the show to wrap up the week that was in Canadian agriculture, but make sure you check out realagriculture.com. You can also subscribe to our free newsletters by going to realagriculture.com slash subscribe. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Egg on the Weekend. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.